today we have the pleasure of talking to Mohit Sevak, principal data scientist. The designation that each and every kid dreams of getting in 2020, getting into data, getting into data science and becoming a data scientist. Principal data scientist in no other place than Microsoft. He works out of India Development Center, Microsoft in Hyderabad. Welcome to the show, Mohit Sevar. Thanks for inviting me, Doctor. Well, uh, this is Dr. Ishwa Krishnaya, Admissions Director of Great Lakes Institute of Management and currently a faculty in the school. Can you tell me something about your journey, Mohit, before you came to Great Lakes Institute of Management? I completed my engineering in Marine, so I am a, like BE Marine from uh, Marine Engineering and Research Institute, Kolkata. The admission of that college is again IIT uh, JE, but it's not like the regular engineering that anyone would do. It's completely hands-on engineering into different types of uh, mechanical and refrigeration and other sort of systems. And after that, I sailed for around five years uh, into different uh, for different types of uh, vessels into a merchant navy and got very rich experiences over there and both in supply chain too. yeah <laughs> so i've seen almost all the continents and then i realized i need to come back to my motherland india i came back i also started a business uh, very uh, for a small while i think a year or so i broke even that business and then i, I realized to scale it better like uh, these are not type of things that i would enjoy and then I thought I should be doing an MBA. The reasons for doing an MBA were multiple fold. The first thing was uh, I was highly inclined towards two things. Uh, number one was uh, uh, mathematics. That point in time, we didn't have anything as professionally uh, analytics in uh, domains. Apart from, I think, FMCG was doing some sort of analytics core statistics department that they had. And actuarial sciences and in government of India, it was be mostly your uh, census department who was doing analytics. So the one thing was that the second thing was I obviously needed to change the domain. No one would take actually uh, someone who is done uh, marine engineering into a land based job. And the third one was I've already got experiences both working hands on and to a business. Now to get into corporate world, this will be a new thing. So I didn't require uh, for to be honest, like a two year MBA, but uh, to get more on things, a one year MBA, especially uh, focused towards analytics would have uh, done very good job for me. So I got offers from multiple institutes, but I think the positioning of Great Lakes and uh, one year MBA suited best. So that was my journey before and that is how I actually ended up in Great Lakes. So for, for my new students who are currently listening to both of us, listen to his background and then most of your doubts would get over. He comes from a marine engineering degree, then a marine travel background, then an entrepreneurial venture for a short time. He tells he broke even with that venture. It doesn't have any typical corporate experience before Great Lakes Institute of Management. His love was for mathematics. Remember that word mathematics. Students loving mathematics is a very rare thing. And there he is into Great Lakes Institute of Management. And from then on, it just took one decade, just 10 years to reach where I initially told you where he has reached principal data scientist of Microsoft. Mohit, I've seen from your LinkedIn uh, profile that you had a really, really distinguished set of companies in which you worked in. You were there, I think you had a short stint in Infosys, then you went to Microsoft, then you went to uh, Bank of America, and then finally right now you're in uh, Microsoft. So can you sort of map your journey um, after Great Lakes and what were your roles in these companies and what were your achievements? Yeah, that's a very good question because uh, Besides the company that has been uh, changed, there has been a lot of role changes as well. And now I'm very fortunate to have uh, seen like all the entire spectrum of roles that are possible in uh, AI. So it started with a consultant uh, and then a project and a program manager. Obviously, I had some project and program manager uh, in Infosys. Then I joined uh, IBM. Uh, to be more specific, there's a company in IBM called IBM Software Labs, which builds all the softwares uh, that we know are IBM softwares. The SPS is more that? specific. Yeah, so to be more specific, I was a part of uh, IBM SPSS. Uh, I was the okay. India architect for uh, the SPSS suite. So I was uh, I joined there with SPSS uh, statistics. And that is also one of the things that I also developed in uh, Great Lakes and kept practicing it throughout also. And uh, that that point in time, I was promoted to, you can say, 
an initiative which is called industrial analytics uh, initiative so i joined a product uh, which was spawned as a plc project but it then became like one of the best selling uh, pro- uh, product within ibm which is uh, now called ibm watson iot and that point in time that was called uh, ibm predictive maintenance and quality and i was the global analytics architect for that particular product and then i left ibm and i joined uh, bank of new york mellon uh, that was a captus obviously you're expecting a completely different role uh, a lot of uh, research plus development plus actually execution would be uh, combined together in those sort of a roles so they are coming up with a concept called nexin which was uh, your analytics api or apis for the complete finance industries and i was trying to uh, put a lot of uh, initiatives to how do you also include analytics and uh, predictive uh, analytics and machine learning apis or, or products into that so we started with a product called uh, now we called isafe which was into security uh, machine learning and then we did a lot of other initiatives on process automation recommendations so so very fortunate enough to actually get into a company which is the largest or you can say custodian bank and an end to end like all type of financial services that you know about is uh, something that the bny mellon uh, does and then i got a call back from ibm and they were restructuring and they were coming up with a new product in india which was ibm watson commerce uh, so i was researching for a lot of different algorithm for watson commerce and that is also a lot of uh, different patents come from so i think currently i have more than 12 patents uh, a lot of those patents are for watson commerce some are for uh, i think spss and the other are for uh, watson iot and some are technology patents in uh, general in ai and other different uh, things so uh, then after that particular role that was a mixed role so one of my initiatives was with the uh, ibm gps which is the global business services that was more in time towards uh, nlp uh, what's in knowledge graph custom knowledge graphs and nlp solutions and then the other one was again linked with the software labs that was more inclined towards the you can say vision part of uh, deep learning in terms of what's in commerce and then when i uh, left ibm i joined a startup called qio this is a startup a startup in industry 4.0 uh, or what they call is like ai infused industry 4.0 so they specialized in building ai products for different types of industry 4.0 processes so it could be like ranging from predictive maintenance to process automation uh, understanding complex uh, uh, hierarchies within the process and the correlations within them so initially joined them as a reinforcement learning engineer so that point in time uh, reinforcement learning also was not like a very uh, established field in itself so apart from open ai and uh, some uh, google related projects on autonomous vehicles no one was doing actually uh, reinforcement learning which has a very pinpoint focus towards application to different types of uh, industries so i had some experiences on that in fact i also had a book in uh, reinforcement learning then or to be more precise deep reinforcement learning which is like a combination of deep learning and reinforcement learning so i joined them initially as a reinforcement learning engineer and then my role over the period changed and it became like the lead of the artificial intelligence for uh, building ai uh, products for different types of uh, industries or different types of processes within industry 4.0 and then i joined uh, microsoft in microsoft also uh, the role is uh, very much in trying towards security and compliance uh, uh, which and the role is related to research in that so even in microsoft also there are different types of team one team is uh, focused towards uh, the r&d or the science part of it and then it goes into the development and there are like very unique challenges in compliance and in fact compliance is one of the growing field uh, within uh, the whole gamut of uh, ai where AI has touched it, but not as much as uh, other industries. And there's a lot of scope that we are seeing for AI in compliance, and that is the problem that I'm uh, trying to solve over here. Mohit, today the so-called business analytics and artificial intelligence world is filled with a slew of terminologies. So, can I ask you three set of differences, and you can probably, from the helicopter view which you're having, give us exactly what those differences are, and the new batch would get that differences precisely. Difference number one. What is the difference between machine learning and deep learning? Okay, interesting question. It has actually different uh, sort of connotations. So the industrial connotation says uh, deep learning is uh, the highest, and machine learning lies somewhere uh, behind. But that's the wrong answer to me because uh, I also come from an academic background, and uh, my PhD is also in AI. So just to connect things more, uh, you can say technically. 
machine learning is actually a superset. Uh, so anything, yeah, if you're teaching a machine to do anything, uh, is prediction or anything, that is machine learning. Obviously, it is slightly different from data mining, uh, which would actually we'll cut, talk about later. But uh, within machine learning, all these algorithms of our prediction, both supervised and supervised, will start coming up. Deep learning would be a sub part of machine learning, which would deal into using neurons to solve different problems or deep learning architectures. Now, even neurons will have like uh, different ways. So you can actually build an artificial neural networks with just three layers, input layer, output layer, and one hidden layer. At that point in time, you will not call it a deep learning architecture or a deep architecture. Until some point in time, there were like some mathematical constraints because of which the network couldn't do deep. And even if you make it deep, it will not be able to learn anything. So there were some issues related to gradients and other things uh, in the learning. Now we can actually make uh, networks very, very deep. So the same new artificial neural networks, if you so make it deep with a lot of layers is what you're correct, about. multiple hidden layers in different forms. Uh, you can actually put it in different architectures, but it has to be like multiple layers. That will, uh, when it will start falling into the deep learning. Again, uh, it follows the same hierarchy of machine learning. It will have like supervised deep learning also and supervised uh, network architectures also. But it will be a sub part of your uh, subset of your machine learning. Which brings us to the next question, Mohit. What's the difference hmm. between supervised learning and unsupervised learning? Okay. So let me broaden your question to different types of learnings within machine learning or otherwise. So as you rightly pointed out, the most prominent one is the unsupervised and the supervised learning. So in case if you have a label for the data and the corresponding data for that particular label, and you're just teaching the machine, if I see a particular record and this is the label, and if I give you the next record, what should be the label for it? This in turn a supervised learning. So you have supervised algorithm in terms of the labels that you are seeing. There might be a lot of different other problems where the label might not be available. And you're just uh, teaching the machine uh, learning algorithm to just draw patterns or understand patterns from that uh, data. And those patterns could be later used for different purposes for either building an algorithm or assisting algorithms or doing anything and understanding the domain, understanding the data. In that case, it can be called uh, semi uh, unsupervised. There are different types of other learnings also. For example, one type of learning is semi-supervised, which comes in between supervised and semi-supervised. So uh, you will have start with plain data. You can have like some labels around it, and then you'll use uh, different types of algorithms to discover labels for other data. That may fall into the uh, area of active learning also, semi-supervised also. There are like uh, strict differences between them. I will not go into that, but uh, a lot of different things. Then there's a fourth theme, which is uh, called uh, reinforcement learning. So this is different from both supervised, unsupervised, and semi-supervised. In the sense that you do have something uh, which you can supervise, in this case, it is a reward, but that reward is not tied to specific data. It can be like sequence of things that you do, not specifically the data as it is coming up. Each of them have its own application areas and uh, where it should be applied and the application that you can empower. The next difference could be, what's the difference between the terminology called machine learning and data science? Okay, so data science is an umbrella term. So anything about data can come under that. Machine learning, as I said, is a very specific terminology in which uh, it's slightly different from data mining, but anything if you're building an algorithm, whether it's a supervised or unsupervised for uh, the data, especially with the newer technologies, then it will be coming under machine learning. Once upon a time, ABC when we were in school had its own connotations. Today, A stands for analytics, B stands for business, and C stands for the world of computers. Without <laughs> these three coming together, there is no learning at all today. So can you try to hierarchify the importance from a business school point of view of analytics, algorithms, and that world, business as we understand from a pure business school perspective, and the relevance of computers and computing, ABC. Okay. I think we are forgetting the fourth part, which is D, which is the data, because without data, you cannot run businesses. Oh. So nowadays, like we have seen the error where you'll just uh, come up with very fancy algorithms. You'll try to put it on the limited set of data that works or doesn't work. So you try to force fit your insight into what you have developed. Nowadays, things are changing because we are discovering that uh, we are using just one or two percent of the entire data that is possible. Because earlier it was an assumption that this the other data, which is also now known as dark data, there has been like different terminologies to it. It was called like big data earlier that you cannot uh, 
a mine or something like that but now there is a uh, more of a like a consensus that it yet can be called dark data because now there are different technologies that you can still mine and if any of the existing technologies couldn't mine that particular data for insights that is dark data we do not know about it so nowadays there are more realization that there's a lot of dark data and we need to find technologies to get insights from that and a lot of different businesses could benefit from uh, those insights so we saw that especially in industry 4.0 uh, where we they had like a lot of different sensors we couldn't uh, get the meaning of uh, those because they speak a different language uh, we could see why like, one sensor series in isolation we can but it becomes very difficult to combine different sensors to see like what uh, when the machine is going to fail or even if the sensors tell when the machine is going to fail we are seeing that trend all over in the case of vision also now uh, we are trying to make the machine learn what we see and most of the inspiration that we are drawing is from our own eyes and that is how uh, our own senses are now powering these all the insights from our own sensor are powering these algorithms so there was data earlier we, we couldn't analyze it the way that we are doing nowadays the trend is on end to end deep learning uh, that trend started with neural machine translations in which we found it much better to have like an end to end model to do from one language to another without actually getting embeddings and uh, serializing them into different algorithms and that sort of insight is now being copied to different other algorithms and different other applications also and nowadays i think we have used uh, at least a superhuman capabilities in terms of uh, what nlps uh, could do or bigger models like uh, open ai gpt3 or microsoft bing or google bard could do in the space, space of nlp so i think when you start combining all these four which is like the analytics or these algorithms the business part of it the application area that has to be very good because uh, right after if you have just done your mba and you are getting out you have an inclination of just applying something that you know like if you are a hammer you just find a nail everywhere so getting the right applications of the business then obviously the c is the computer which is nowhere all where uh, with us and the d which is the right data for that particular type of applications in the sequence it may not be exactly a b c d to my understanding it, it may differ from different person to person the first thing starts with business you uh, try to understand which is the roi drivers in that business obviously then the technology might not be ready for it so either the algorithm might not be ready or you might not be ready with the computer c part is something that people ignore but especially in the case of deep learning and dealing with very very large models we see compute is now becoming a lot critical we have the models now that can work but to scale them to that level that it can actually or web scale level or the complete enterprise scale level we do not have enough compute and uh, a lot of things actually get told because of the budget that the computer requires you may actually require data center level compute just for some applications even in in the enterprise i'm not talking about like high performance computing but even at the enterprise level and then fourth is the most important thing is the data itself so that is how i think the mastering these fours can actually lead to very good problem solving in all the types of businesses mohit these days we find there's a lot of overlap between what b schools used to teach and what good tech schools used to teach b schools used to start obviously from business and then come down to analytics then come down to technology today we're thinking of moving all the way down to devices a good tech school always starts at solid state physics devices then go to technology and slowly now they are inching their way upwards and competing with other analytics hopefully they don't come to business so where do you see this interplay happening and is it a good thing the trend that we all tend to see teach more or less the same thing these days yeah so when i came to or joined mba i found that many people had an inspiration behind joining mba that they do not want to code and that is what the logical progression that they saw that they wanted to get into managerial lines and stop coding and get to what they uh, seem to believe is like more value added uh, work in industry i think that has taken uh, the industry 360 degree now and nowadays what i see uh, for different industries uh, is uh, the core value added things are considered to be people who are hands on and who actually code irrespective of their degrees irrespective of their number of years of experience irrespective of their background even if you are an engineer and a mechanical engineer you cannot code there's a limited value that you can add even if you have gone grown up in your career you have become an architect or even a managerial person and you do not understand the technology there's limited value that you can add nowadays despite the fact that uh, not everyone is expected to code these days but everyone is now expected to understand what is being coded 
or how do businesses change so every business is now a digital business and even if you believe that you are in an industry that is not a digital business very soon you'll be out of your business itself we have seen this industry after industry each industry has now been transformed by a newcomer who was not supposed to be a industry player or that industry player he was supposed to be a, like a digital player and they revolutionized that industry so much so that even the incumbents of that industry are nowhere close to their market capitalization so nowadays each industry is a digital industry and the recipe of the digital industry is keep be hands on if even if you are not hands on be very abreast with the technologies so you have rightly said it uh, that now there is no different teams of management of technologies of even within technologies like say technology x technology y and in fact nowadays everyone is trying to add value and become a problem solver and it only depends upon how far you go to solve that particular problem and more you keep barriers to yourself that i am a technology institute i am a management institute that is like creating a lot of hindrance to how much value you can add to the final product continuing on our conversation mohit uh, today the key word is innovation and without innovation we are just not going anywhere and as someone like you who has got a lot of patents and a very very creative bend of mind can you tell us the importance of innovation today in the area of technology and in the area of management in general right so i think there is a lot of commonality between what we see as uh, value in industry so in microsoft also we have like a keyword which is responsible ai and a lot of that responsibility comes for uh, comes from diversity and inclusion and that i believe is also something that brings about innovation uh, and creative mindset in any enterprise i'll take the example of myself so as i explained my background was not into it i am a core engineer working hands on on different types of technology in fact i left the core uh, iits just to follow my passion on learning different types of engineering made with mechanical electrical electronics so i saw how these uh, technologies actually amalgamate uh, to into different forms to different creative forms so it in one form it may actually give birth to one particular product in second form it will give to different types of products when you combine the knowledge of business administration and business management to it you start finding out business problems which could be benefited from different amalgamations of uh, technologies and when you add to it your core knowledge of mathematics and analytics uh, and machine learning and then you add to it like your prowess of uh, the coding that is when it takes you your eagerness a bit forward to actual actualization of uh, the outcomes of it so that is what i believe is uh, driving the innovation of uh, for me so all the patents if you see of mine uh, are coming up from the different amalgamation of technologies which might be used in some other industry but i try to put it into a different completely different context that no one would have thought of uh, earlier and it's all real business problem the good thing about that is also that it gives rise to high business value patents so uh, just number of patents doesn't count till so they are not uh, like high business value patents and those are the also the things that i talk about in either my youtube channel or my books or my different papers the actual applications of technologies and the mathematics around it so i think even to drive the diversity and inclusion into the real products and real businesses has a real value one last question to you mohit is what would be your advice to the current mba students based on your own learnings from great lakes and uh, your own career path in the last 10 years where would you advise the current youngsters what should they do how should they plan what should they study and what should they focus on okay thanks i think this is a very good and very relevant question because i see uh, in the current times uh, analytics is at its peak it's trending and i see everyone is getting forced into it uh, so much so even if they do not and they're not inclined and bent towards either mathematics or coding they are trying to adopt a complete career in analytics and I, when i say adopt a complete career i mean like as a primary career in analytics which i don't think is the right thing because if something is at a peak right now not sure it will be at a peak uh, 10 years from now no one can predict that the second thing is in doing that in catching up on to those things many people i have seen forget their strengths uh, what they naturally enjoy and love to do 
I am here because not because uh, analytics uh, was at great at that point in time, and I was thinking like, okay, I can earn like this many if I get into an analytics, and that is why I got into an analytics. That didn't happen with me. I came into Great Lakes, and then I excelled from here because of my natural passion in mathematics, coding, robotics, and other things. And that is was the type of MBA that I wanted to do. And the first job that I got may not have much to do with analytics. and i kept on finding avenues where i could apply analytics to be better at my job and my role and that is how it started developing and that is how i started uh, benefiting my uh, within my role so i the last thing is you do not have to become or try to fly high if you are a fish so if you are a fish find the cleanest water and a company that can swim deep with you and that will sail you through so try to find your strengths what you love and try to just become number 1 in that particular thing and you will definitely succeed in life if you do not like analytics just don't run after it if you like analytics but you are scared or you do not want to make it as your primary career just relax just don't make it just learn it and try to apply it in whatever you do best so the bottom line is understand yourself understand your strengths just focus on your strengths just forget the weaknesses and other things or the buzz around or what trend around just focus on what are your strengths keep building on your strengths and you'll definitely succeed one day thank you mohit sevak that was mohit sevak principal data scientist microsoft india development center working out of hyderabad talking to us and sharing his thoughts on how within a 10 year span a boy who was just a marine engineer with no technology background was roaming all over the world enjoying his life in a ship transform himself through a series of brilliant companies infosys ibm and then finally to microsoft and currently is occupying the pride of position as a top notch data scientist of this country thank you mohit seva thanks again and the best wishes to all the students of great lakes thank you so much